Hello, I think we are up. Okay, hi, my name is Craig Volk. We're here for this Q&A with the filmmakers of an amazing film called Oberlin. If you haven't seen it yet, you have to see it. One best documentary and it's nominated for a number of other awards. Um, I watched it again on Sunday for a second time. I'm every bit is fascinated by it. The filmmakers, Elizabeth and Revere are here. It's a film that took six years in the making. It was made on four different continents. It has three narratives that run through it. That uh, tracks an animal, a, excuse me, an eagle hunter, a hawk whisperer, a falcon racer, uh, awaking an ancient art to connect to the wild that is fading out of sight and out of mind. I was going to ask you quickly. You earlier you called them falconers. Are all is that what their the 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 single term is for all those people? Even they're not necessarily working with falcons. It is falconry. It Technically, the definition of falconry is using a bird of prey okay. to hunt wild quarry in its native habitat. That's the sort of Webster's Dictionary, but you can use a, anything from a kestrel to a eagle and be considered a falconer. Right, as they do in your film, um, and there's an eagle and a hawk. Uh, this film has already been, it's on the festival circuit now. It's been at the Ashland Film Festival and the Santa Barbara Film Festival. And it won uh, the best uh, Living with the Wildlife film at the International Wildlife uh, Film Festival. Welcome. Thanks. To Thanks. The, the virtual Breckenridge. We were just talking about what an odd thing it is to try to uh, wrap one's head around a festival where the good news is, you don't have to travel to Breckenridge. You don't have to worry about weather, and you can see it at any time. These films, so uh, please do. Um, now I'm going to. I don't know. We're pretty bummed about not being able yeah. to come to Breckenridge. No, not coming to Breckenridge when it's leaf beeping time. This is a great place. I was up on the mountain like two days, ago, uh, two weeks ago, and I was just starting to turn there. It's, I mean, wow. Breckenridge. that this gold, is, like the golden, the golden color. Yep, beautiful. It is, and you know the mountains and. It, Breckenridge itself is beautiful. I mean, it's really a treat to be a part of this festival. Um, I'm going to start, you know, here you are. This is an independent film that has its own, the challenge of its very independence, right? That Meaning that pressing need to raise the necessary production funds. I mean, this is a huge project. This is, I mean, this isn't some project that someone makes locally, a, you know, a doc or, you know, it's one filmmaker going out and shooting some local narrative. So how did you manage that cha challenge with Overland? To well, I, I think, first of all, I just want to say hi to any, anybody that's out there. We, we can't see you. So um, we'll just speak to the, to Craig. <laughs> and what's what's so interesting about that question is where we are right now, which is at our kitchen table, and you know, ten feet over that way is, is our couch where we were watching something where like all of our quote unquote pre-production conversations happen. This is like a a homemade movie that um, was conceptualized, you know, at our kitchen table, and then um, then the real sort of magic trick of getting to the places, um, getting access to the places was all done, you know, via phone calls, taking to, um, into effect, you know, various time zones and things like that. And Biz, that's one of her, uh, I'll just say one of her superhero powers <laughs> is, you know, I might have the, this fun idea like, hey, what if we shot this skull or whatever, and, but we'd never be able to do it. And then sure enough, a few weeks later, Biz would say, we've got it, we're good. <laughs> Uh, and so the access that she was able to get is just really amazing. Yeah, I mean, we put the film together um, sort of one brick at a time in one, a lot of shoot, ways, one, one shoot, shoot one at character. a time. We, the idea marinated for quite a while before we raised our first money. It's, but, and, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. That's all right. Yeah, what I wanted to know is you said there, why don't you explain that the, the, where the sort of the three narratives sort of reside for people who might not have seen it yet, okay? Uh, those three very distinct uh, you know, plot lines that you have. Yeah, so the film takes place in seven countries when it's three 
main characters. Uh, Lauren, who is the young woman in the film, um, she partners with two eagles through the course of the film. And the first half of the film, her story unfolds in the United States. Uh, well, after a brief opening in Scotland where she's finishing her PhD. And in the second half of the film, it's in South Africa where she's training a rehabilitating an eagle. And then Giovanni is a, our character from Europe. He lives in Abruzzo, Italy, which is between Rome and the Adriatic Sea, a really remarkable wild place in Italy that um, I would highly recommend visiting to anybody who wants to eat well and see beautiful things and go on beautiful hikes and meet lovely people. But he, he's in Abruzzo, and then Khalifa bin Mijrin is in Dubai, in the outskirts of Dubai, and he is the head falcon racer for the Crown Prince of Dubai. And we met them all really different ways. Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? I think we... Sure. Um, we, some people want to know kind of how we got into the movie, and, and that blends in a little bit, which is that um, earlier on in our career when we were working together, we had um, come across some falconers and, and seen falconry in action. And one of those falconers we got in touch with and we finally decided to try and make this movie. And he gave us the name of Lauren and said, you know, this is an amazing woman, um, see if you can get in touch with her. So we actually ended up meeting her in Scotland and she began to regale us with these tales of Mongolia. And we're like, okay, good, okay, we got one, you know? <laughs> um, and then, you know, this thought being that we would do something in the Middle East just because of the amazing rich character there and um, the, the Silk Road coming into, into sort of the Persian area. And so, and falconry was likely, you know, it's debatable whether it started in Mongolia or someplace in modern day Iran. It's uh, it probably happened in both places simultaneously, yeah. but it's, it's a tradition that literally kept the Bedouins alive in the desert. And we wanted to highlight a culture that was really um, had it as a key cornerstone in their sort of identity. Falconry is a really, really big deal. You see falcons everywhere on their ba on their banks, in their airports. Um, it's, yeah, I always said falconry is like sort of um, for Khalifa, it's like his grandchildren and golf would be for, for an American. I mean, it's really a, a cherished pastime with a really important um, heritage element. So when we got to Dubai, basically we kind of asked around and they said, well, there's Khalifa. He's like the Michael Jordan of falconry. Um, and so when we met him, there's not a very deep Falcon, excuse me, documentary tradition in, in Dubai at all. So he had no idea why we would want to film with him um, longer than really like an hour. And uh, over time, when, when he saw, I think, the care and passion with which we wanted to tell his story, he kind of bought in as well. But that was always a work in progress, our relationship with Khalifa, and it's still going strong. Um, and then Giovanni, we sort of scoured the internet and found, found his, his world and saw him riding his horse and kind of his medieval approach to falconry and thought that might be an interesting story to follow. Yeah, I mean, we became, Giovanni and I became Facebook friends actually and started sending messages back and forth to each other. And we set out for Italy having never actually met him face to face with our entire film crew because mm -hmm. We had a lovely thing going on, you know, FaceTime. And uh, he, he was like, oh, I have a small farm. It's very nice here. And then we showed up and it was like, yes, this is amazing. And, um, you know, he also was surprised that we wanted to come back multiple times and follow his story over the course of years. And I think initially when we conceived of the film, we didn't know that it would be three characters. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know um, it was probably initially conceptually a broader film with more characters from more countries. But as we started filming with, uh, you know, there were some other people we filmed with briefly that, you know, we decided weren't the right characters to pursue the right people to pursue. But we really realized that the conversations that these characters were having with each other in our heads, <laughs> if that makes any sense, uh, we're going to be enough and we're going to be really interesting. And so we committed to those three sets of stories and 
We got some early fu funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, some development funding that launched us into the field. And then we brought on a team of um, executive producers who have been incredible partners. Um, they've really supported the project at every difficult point, including now when we're trying to figure out how to manage distribution in the era of COVID and our entire plans have been interrupted. But, um, you know, there was a big team of people that collaborated to help us make the film in, in that sense. Yeah, I was going to mention too, I thought a, a, a very poignant extra layer of narrative that happened with Giovanni was he and his sort of troubled son, that, that, that part of the, uh, I, I thought, added a, a, a very effective dimension. Um, there's been a question, and I asked you the question before too, to talk about how you went about getting all those beautiful shots. Because uh, uh, it really, I mean, there is a, a beauty in the land in all these various countries you went to. Um, how did you do that? Well, I think um, you one of the you're up in drones. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said you weren't up in airplanes. You were using a drone. Um, yeah. that. How did you do when, it? When we were sort of conceptualizing how this movie um, would would be catered to the to the topic that we were filming, we came up with these three words, which were epic, intimate, and textured. And at first, they might sound sort of how do they live in the same space? But um, because of the sweeping nature of the sport. And, and the places it takes place, uh, the places it happens, epic seemed like an important word. But then textured meant that we wanted to go into these cultures, understand these people and look more deeply than just a, you know, excuse the pun, flyover. Um, and then intimate was, let's find out what is going on in that space between the bird of prey and the, the person holding it. What, what, is, what is going on there? What, what is the appeal? Um, and then when we knew that's what we were after, then we decided, okay, using our lens, let's look wide, let's look super macro, and let's make good use of our drone shots because the drone has an amazing ability to change perspective very quickly, just like a bird does. Um, so our drone paths were really never flyovers, but they always had a kind of a storyline to them. I, I'm really pleased with the way that came out. Yeah, I mean, we worked with this cinematographer named Ben Pritchard, and he was with us um, from day one on this film. And a lot of the aesthetic of the film comes out of Revere's experience in terms of being a painter and a visual artist. And, you know, he really had some strong ideas that we had to work with our team to, to realize. You know, the whole, we shot the film in sometimes up to 8K. Uh, it was a huge amount of data that we were gathering. If anyone is a tech nerd, it was a nightmare. We had, we shot the whole film on prime lenses. We never had a zoom lens on our camera with the exception of a really, really, really long lens that we, we were used filming occasionally. The birds in the sky. Yeah, in the sky. But, um, we, we would commit to a lens and stick with it for several hours because we, even though we had incredibly high production value, we were almost never more than a crew of eight people. So we didn't have, you know, a bunch of people that we could say, ah, I need the 85 millimeter now. Like it, we just we tried to keep it small and nimble. Uh, you know, we were working in places where there were wolves and eagles and you just can't have a big crew traipsing around. It would change everything. Including wolves in the frame. Those were Giovanni's. Those were full blood wolves. He had, were they? Well, they they're four like fifth they wolf, wolf and wolves. yeah, <laughs> they look like they're full, but they're four fifth wolf and one fifth like Siberian husky or something. Oh, really? But oh. they're skittish. They're not pets. It's <laughs> always funny when you're kind of heading into to a shoot and you've got to brief your crew if they're new or remind them, and you're going, okay, so we're going to this farm. It's kind of in the middle of, of nowhere in Abruzzo. And there's going to be this little farmhouse and then this, this wall around it. Now, here's the thing. He's got these hawks, but he also has a really big horse that kind of guards the place. And then there are these wolves. Now, <laughs> before you say no, here's the deal. We're going to go in and we're going to park and we're just going to sit there and let the wolves run around the car a little bit. And then you get out and you don't make any eye contact. You know, so you're you're kind of, each, each location had a little bit of that. 
and, and we also had to you know prep them about um sort of cultural traditions in Dubai and, and the way you touch or don't touch and speak and each place had its very unique challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, just working with wild animals, you know, the, the, the eagles that Lauren trains are still wild at heart. And so you never really know what's gonna happen the minute they're unhooded and on your wrist and then they fly off, it could be, things sometimes went our way and sometimes it was Just six gone. hours later and we yeah. were tracing through yeah. a field somewhere looking for something and so all the best planning would just go right out the window so we always had an agenda and sort of a wish list every day but i think that one thing that really um helped us was the ability to stay nimble and communicate with our crew. I think they might have thought we were a little bit crazy because whenever Revere and I were, were married and a filmmaking team, whenever we sort of had a disagreement, we'd go for a little stroll. Not and a disagreement between us, but a disagreement between the us film. and the filmmaking team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or, you know, we, we just sort of turn and walk away and then they would always know they don't like what we're doing. <laughs> 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 Mom and dad are mad. <laughs> you mentioned that, you know, it's, I, I wanted to ask you about how indeed you work together. I mean, you, the two of you were listed as the director and the editor and the writer and the producer. How do you break down that work and accomplish the task at hand as a couple? Well, um, you know, we, we are lucky that we have a certain set of overlapping skills and then we each have our own uh, strengths. So like Revere mentioned, I'm, I love sort of the logistics of production and figuring all of that out. And so that was part of my sphere. And I really, Revere has this incredible visual mind and he could see these drone shots that I could never come up with in a million years. So we knew when we had to cede to the other person's expertise. Um, or rely on or them. Rely on them. Seed, but... and, you know, I think the hardest part of making this film for us was not in the field. It That's was right. editing. Editing was, it was editing. because there's only one keyboard, right? So when you're out in the field, you've got all kinds of things you can be doing. And then when it's editing, uh, so Biz does not like people's fingers on the keyboard. <laughs> we actually, we actually find, you know, for, for people who, who do end up working with any kind of collaborator where, where it's really, um, there's an equal relationship. We, we came up with this concept of a happy meadow, as corny as it sounds, but that this belief that every scene, every shot, there was an answer that would suit both of us. And so I, I think we never, either one of us ever and had to actually end up compromising where we said, well, I don't like it, but go for it. And yeah. so it took us a year and, year and a quarter to edit the movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it, we also edit really differently, just like we think differently. And so it was really fun to come into the edit room and watch what the other person had done. Um, and then sometimes like, what have you done? You took all the best parts of this out. It's on a separate timeline. It's on a separate timeline. <laughs> yeah, but we're still married. I mean, we survived. <laughs> the rough cut, right? You just keep yeah. telling each other, just a rough cut. It's, it's just a rough cut. cut. It's just a rough yeah. cut. It was the day, you know, and then there's all the finishing of the film, which was a tremendous job on this, on this project. I mean, tell what finishing is. yeah, we had, um, a, a huge amount of footage that had to be like up res back from the smaller files that were you were using to edit it and you know make its way to the collaborators we were working with in New York on the color correction and you know they hadn't had a documentary client shoot on this technology yet mm -hmm. and so it was a bit of a learning curve for all of us to figure out how to best handle um, the color I know one night Revere went home and painted the 45 colors of sand in Dubai to bring back to the okay. colorist. <laughs> Just in my defense, and I, again, I think if there are filmmakers, um, this is sort of an interesting thing, which is that when you shoot on these huge format cameras that are supposed to be used for commercials or potentially Hollywood films, um, you have looks, you know, okay, you set this color look for this scene and every time it's in this room, it's gonna look like this. Well, like our it. film is shot, 98% of it is outside yeah. and the sun is always changing. And there are something like 45 or 50 locations in the film and it rarely ever goes back to the place that it was before. 
So every single shot had to be understood. The color had to be understood with someone who's in New York City who's never been to Azerbaijan, never been inside the Crown Prince's training facility. And so you say the word ochre, you're like, it's kind of like an ochre or burnt umber. And he's going, what? So you actually end up having to find verbal tools to explain color. And yeah, I think I just ended up going to the paint store. It was great though. I mean, once he understood that we were not interested in the aesthetic that most people are interested in that shoot on those cameras, it became a really fun collaboration. Yeah. And likewise with the with the mix on the film, I mean, we had two, we had an incredible composer, Hugo Descher, yeah, who scored the film and he was just so talented. Very and good. we had a second per, per composer, a younger guy named Alex Umfleet, and they worked together. And then we had to mix. The, so one was in London and one was in North Carolina. Where we are. Yeah. And, and so was... it, it was, you know, a lot, uh, he, they probably also thought we were very picky, but um, we got what we wanted and what we, I think they never felt like they settled either. You know, we wanted everyone to do what they considered their very best work on the project. And um, that was just an expectation we had a sort of that everyone would put out the most excellent work that they could. And we always tried to do it too. And I think that everyone ended up inspiring each other in that sense. And, um, and we had executive producers that stood by us and said, you can't rush art, which is no small thing. It sounds like a cliche, but to be able to say, no, we're going to work this through. This score is going to take six months and not six weeks. Um, and everybody pinched pennies, don't get me wrong, but, but to have people stick by that creative process was amazing. Yeah. No, and it clearly shows on the screen. I mean, that attention to detail across all the elements that make for a good film are, are there. Uh, yeah. Even including that last song. What's that last song when the credits are going? Who's that? Oh, uh, that there's a artist named Shara Nova uh, and it's her rendition. Her, her, her uh, group or her name is called My Brightest Diamond. Yeah, um, I've heard it's that her song. Her rendition of Feeling yeah. Good. Yeah. Which actually, interestingly enough, I, I she was playing downtown and I took is there for her birthday and we saw her and heard her play that song live and we went oh my gosh yeah. what if that that song needs to be in our movie because it's such a spooky rendition of that song yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful yeah. Awesome song there at the end yeah now, i wanted to ask you you know we talked about some of your it's sort of this challenge and this is just a, somewhat of interest to me you're on the festival circuit now and you're and that's a challenge because of the pandemic but then beyond that, what are your hopes and dreams for how you're going to distribute this film? I mean, it seems to me this is a kind of film, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before. I've, I've looked at all the docs, which is 80 to 100 docs. And this film seems to have the potential to have a lot of different ways in which you could get it out in the world beyond festivals. What are your hopes and dreams of doing that? I mean, what's in Well, the, I mean, the first thing I would, thing I would say, say is that. Yeah. Is that, is that me doing that? Okay, is that when we were looking for someone to help us distribute this, uh, we looked at a lot of different partners and, and the, the partner that we went with said, this movie deserves to be on a giant screen and you guys should wait it out. Um, and so that, you know, as opposed to kind of making a quick turnaround, we really loved hearing that, you know, that someone would be willing to stick with this through it. And so I think, you know, we've always said, what would it be like to see an eagle 50 feet across on the screen flying at you? And we have had the opportunity to see it one time, you know, three our, times, three times <laughs> in our, in our first, you know, at our world premiere. Uh, and it, I got to tell you, you know, it's really something. So that's, that's our big thing. We want as many people, not just in the United States, but internationally to see it, um, yeah, exactly. a big screen and proper sound. And, uh, and that's priority number one. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, we know that we're used, I guess we're hoping for a, you know, worldwide select city theatrical release and then to do screening tours at universities, at colleges, at, you know, museums, museums um, cultural institutions, that sort of thing. And I'm sure eventually we'll make a sale to an online platform also, but we, believe that film is meant to be experienced in community in theaters and that there's something really 
electric about that experience. We didn't make Overland to be consumed on an iPhone. And the thought of that kind of breaks our heart. At the same time, we're really grateful to places like Breckfilm for giving us a chance to, to screen in these really weird times because who knows when theaters are gonna come back. So we're, we're sort of in a bit of a catch 22 right now, but we've got a good sales agent working on our behalf and we're gonna you know, follow his advice and see what happens. Yeah, um, and then, well, let's, let's uh, next projects. What are you, I mean, what, what are you two working on now uh, <laughs> beyond this? Or are you still com sort of completely focused? It always seems to me that filmmakers having, and being a filmmaker as well, <clears throat> so much time gets spent doing the pre-production, the production, and the post-production, then you're almost exhausted by that time. So the distribution in which we just talked about becomes almost an afterthought. And yeah. everybody assumes, well, now you have to be, you know, the factory has to keep running, right? You have to move on to the next project. So are you guys, are you moving on to the next project or we are i mean we're both we we have an idea in development right now that is a little bit on hold because it is predicated on the relationships and abilities that we built to work globally mm -hmm. and we can't travel to film right now um so we are just sort of holding on that but it's a it's a actually a series not a film um mm -hmm. concept and then I'm cutting a film with a director in San Francisco right now. It's a film about a photographer from the late 1800s. Um, and it's a, it's a really different project than Overland, but one that I've been so grateful to have through the pandemic because it's given me a creative outlet. And, you know, we're both writing narrative work right now. Uh, our background is in documentary, but I think that this film inspired us both to sort of branch a little differently. Um, yeah. I've been really fortunate to have painting work. That was one of our sort of strategies was to diversify a little bit. So I've been able to do some painting and express a lot of the things that I sort of understood throughout the film. I also learned a lot making this movie about, it's almost like making six movies in, in one or whatever. And I learned a lot about how to make images with a small crew mm -hmm. that could play. And so I'm actually writing a screenplay uh, for, for a narrative fiction piece, but using a lot of the same sort of types of shots and imagery that, that we did in Overland. I'm excited about that. Have you entertained the idea at all that any of these three narratives could be a narrative film, could be the basis for a narrative? I mean, they were fascinating characters, uh, all of them. And, uh, you know, the particular one in Dubai, which is just such a, I mean, that's the area I, I didn't, I mean, I, I didn't know anything about that. I, I used to have a friend who, who was a falconer, so I knew a bit about that. And I always remember that moment of walking, the first time he showed me his bird and walking into that shed and the electricity that just seemed to come off that creature, you know, you just didn't want to get close to it. You figured, you know, it would, uh, it would arc over to you. Um, but have you thought about that? Now that you've become kind of experts in this area, um, or if, or if you moved on, that's it. Can I, yeah. I just wanted to say one thing, Craig, real quick, when we were talking about audiences and, and this virtual thing is, if I may, um, if, if anybody watching would like to comment questions to us individually on, on a more sort of one-to-one -one level, overlandmovie.com, we've got a really easy comment thing. We would actually really love to hear from people because it's been such a vacuum. Um, so we would love that. Um, sure. And then just in terms of the, the narrative, I'd like to say we covered the topic and yeah. that if Hollywood tried to do it, like, right. good, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> you might want to get yourself some robot birds. But, but you know, by all means, if, if, there's, if there's a project out there for it, um, we're all ears. Yeah. I mean, we did get to meet uh, probably the best bird wrang wrangler in Hollywood as part of this project. And, he lent us an eagle when we were in Santa Barbara for our world premiere and okay. Lauren couldn't, she couldn't bring her birds across state lines. There's all sorts of things. I mean, she can go across state lines, but she couldn't fly with them. And the drive from Oklahoma to California was long. And so it's a, there are, I, I think that you would have to, 
conceive of a narrative that you could shoot a lot like a doc yeah. to do it and have any authenticity. And we shot a doc that's a lot like the narrative. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> there, was, there was trying to be a fusion. Oh, that's very true. Now I'm looking at the Q and A's. If anybody else has a Q and A out there and wants to ask a specific question, I just, we've been somewhat addressing this. Uh, they did. Uh, we did say earlier that it was six plus years in the making of this film, and obviously, you never know. You know, continuing. Obviously, this <laughs> life of this film is just when you uh, you you uh, put it away. Um, and I was also, you know, I was really taken with those three words you used, epic, intimate, and textured. I mean, anybody who hasn't seen this film, I think all three of those words are really great bullet words for what this film's about. Uh, so I wanna encourage people to look at it. Is, are there any more questions coming? Let's see. Well, thanks. I mean, it's funny because some people really thought it was obnoxious when we used those words together. When, when we hadn't shot anything yet. Mm -hmm. when we were proposing it and we said this is what we wanted and people said you can't, you can't they literally that. would circle it and put kind of like who do they think they are uh, no, you, yeah. you earned all three of those words I mean, we did i mean words. we it, it, yeah they were a bit of a touchstone for us throughout the project and you know i mean i guess that i i think that along the way we certainly took meetings with some of the larger distributors and uh you know, potential co-producing projects and ultimately the control that we were going to have to give up and the kind of story that they were going to want us to tell, which was much more along the lines of, you know, things that you would see um, but more social issue driven. Um, we, we decided to try and do something different and to try and, um, I, it, it was a hard choice to make to not, you know, consider saying, oh my gosh, we could probably have all of our financing in a row and just go ahead and make this movie. But ultimately, I think that the time that it ended up having to take us to be able to put all the pieces in place allowed us to tell a longitudinal story that otherwise we never would have been able to do. So it's a good example of movies taking the time that they need. Um, I also, I also think that um, at least this movie, I haven't, this is my sort of directorial debut. Um, and so it's really only a movie I can speak for, but I find that as we were making this and steering clear of a very specific agenda, enabled the movie to be different things to different people. Mm -hmm. And we kind of feel like the movie gets, what we did gets people 50% of the way there. And then whatever they're bringing with them their relationship to nature, their relationship to these places, their particular mood at the time, um, fills in the rest of the movie. And so it really has become a different movie to different people. And that's, that's as artists, that's really exciting. Yeah. Yes, I, I, and I think that's one of the joys of independent film, the things you were just talking about, that you do control it. You do get to see, you know, you, you don't have to, the person who writes the check, you know, sometimes you just have to cave to what they're, wanting to do and you take the time that it needs i mean as opposed to whatever those those deadlines are i mean this clearly shows i mean this you know this is the kind of film that's you know kind of a joy to to talk about in terms of independent film and you know what the breakfast tries to do as well you know that you know to try to keep that world alive so that filmmakers do have a platform to do it um and I'm going to say this one more time. If you haven't seen this film, you absolutely need to see this film today and tell people to see it. I know you're, some of you are communicating with other virtual festival goers. And it's at breckfilmfest.org is where you get to the site to, uh, to see these films. And please do see this film. Thank you much, oh. Beth. Thanks, Craig. Oh, we really Thank enjoyed it. Them. Thank you for your kind words. You know, we hope that independence yeah, thrives. Well. So, Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Bye all. Bye.